All right, we are finally into an exciting chapter. Chapter five talks about mass murders and serial killers. So the killing of multiple victims is classified based on how much time elapses between the killings, where the killings take place, and the number of people killed. So one thing to keep in mind when the media covers these topics and they talk about mass shooters, they're often using different definitions. So for mass murder, we're talking about a single episodic act of violence occurring at one time in one place, and there's a minimum of three victims. So there's no cooling off periods. Now these are often divided into a variety of different typologies, but it often includes um, disciple killers, family annihilators, pseudo commandos, school shooters, disgruntled employees, and set and run killers. Now the term that we also hear used is a rampage killer, and this is someone who sets out with an arsenal of guns to kill as many people as he can. Um, often randomly, but sometimes it's against people um, who are targeted on purpose, people against whom he has a grievance. So, apologies, this is so tiny. A family annihilator. This is generally a father, um, and it's a suicidal father or intimate partner who kills his whole family, so spouse and children all at once. Usually these are men who are depressed, and they often have a history of alcohol abuse. They often feel alone, helpless, and hopeless. And some examples of this are Susan Smith in 1994 um, and in 2002, Andrea Yates. Now, Pseudo Commando is someone with um, a real affinity for the military, military enthusiasts, and they very strategically plan their attacks. And they often commit suicide by cop. They're preoccupied with weapons. Um, maybe they want to teach the world a lesson. Maybe they want to call attention to an issue or exact re revenge against people. Most are driven by revenge, and victims are chosen because either of the actions they've taken or because of what they represent to that killer. These killers often come from a broken and dysfunctional home, feel rejected, and cannot form close relationships. Uh, they may seek early entry into the armed forces. They may dress in battalion dress uniforms, so basically fatigue. Um, they're attracted to activities that have to do with power and bravado. And they often develop a hatred for people that they can blame for their own weaknesses and misfortunes. They become more and more frustrated with the world and their inability to obtain what they believe they're owed. Uh, this grasp on reality starts decreasing until something finally triggers them. This could be rejection by a woman, a reprimand or a demotion at work, being terminated or some other kind of slight, and then they may erupt. Now a disciple killer is following a charismatic leader. They are obeying orders to murder and act to satisfy that leader and have psychological acceptance. So the murder or the killing is ordered by the leader and the followers achieve some degree of psychological gain. So an example of this would be the Manson family. Now disgruntled employees are what we used to see in terms of um, workplace shootings or mass shootings in the past. These are generally mentally ill, vengeful workers who seek revenge for a perceived wrong. Now these people are often someone who was an employee of the company and they've been counseled, disciplined, dismissed, or placed on some type of leave. Their average age is a little older, it's 38. They're overwhelmingly male and white. So they're generally someone who's overinvested in their job. Um, they don't have a lot of attachments outside their job, so when they lose their job, it's not just about losing the job, but that's the place where they had any companionship um, and contact and communication and relationships with other folks. So they're losing that as well. Now a scent and run killer is a vigilante who utilizes indirect means, bombs, poison, arson, in an attempt to avoid apprehension. They have a need for revenge and if bystanders are killed, that's considered unimportant. This would include the Tylenol poisonings, the Unabomber, um, and um, shortly after 9-11, and maybe through a lot of the first decade of the 2000s, um, there were incidents where people were sending anthrax spores to government officials. Now they might um, be someone who kills a person they actually want to kill, and then commits some other set and run killings that it looks like um, that person was randomly killed. Now school shooters are technically not um, you know, most other uh, CJ-oriented books will not put them in their own 
um, category as far as a typology, but these are men generally. Um, they're continually subjected to frustration, social isolation, and rejection, and often ostracized. Now, your book also does talk about them being bullied, but that's not actually, there, there isn't actually evidence of that. And about one out of four mass killings by teens generally involve a pair. Um, this could be a way of getting approval from a peer, and usually one is dominant. Now, in your book, there's some case studies of mass murderers, and I would like to make sure you please read them because they're really well done and they have a lot of detail um, that isn't uh, or hasn't necessarily been covered in other places. So there's Charles Whit Whitman, James Huberty, um, and Sing, Sing, Sing Hui Cho. Uh, that's the Virginia Tech shooter. Now, a spree murder is something that we don't really hear about as much anymore. The FBI doesn't really use this category because it's not really helpful in terms of investigations. But this is a killing of three or more people without a cooling off period, usually at multiple locations. Uh, they don't stop and wait for recognition of their crime. So this would include Andrew Cunanan. Um, one of Andrew Cunanan's vic uh, victims was um, Versace, Bonnie and Clyde, Charles Starkweather and Carolyn Fugate, and John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo, who are uh, often referred to as the DC snipers, but sometimes they're referred to, um, oh geez, I can't think of the other way they're referred to, but they basically committed a series of killings, um, sniper killings in Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Now, the cooling off period isn't well defined, which is another reason this doesn't really, um, you know, isn't really helpful for us in terms of aiding an investigation. Now, serial killing, serial murders are three killings over a period of time, often months or years. Now, serial killings are not anything new. They date back to ancient times, um, but our understanding of them is a little bit newer. And the first time we see it described in a textbook is 1886. And in 1998, Congress passed the Protection of Children from Sexual Predators Act. And one of the pieces in there had to do with serial killings. And so they defined serial killings for the purpose of this law as three or more killings, not less than one of which was committed in the U.S., having common characteristics such as to suggest a reasonable possibility that the crimes were committed by the same actor or actors. And in 2008, the FBI officially defined this as the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offenders in separate events. Again, generally we're talking about three, but they start to investigate it as a possible serial at two, because if there's two, there's probably going to be a third. Now, up until the second half of the 20th century, most murders were like relationship crimes or means to an end. They were instrumental. In 1965, only 5% of murders were committed by strangers. So most victims and offenders knew each other. By 1994, though, stranger murder is 23% of all murders. And today, nearly half of murders are committed by unknown people. So it could be, that includes not just the strangers, but where we don't know who the killer is, so we don't know what that relationship is. Now your book talks about some myths regarding serial killers as well. So there is these ideas that they're white, they're all men, that they're all insane, they're all lust killers, uh, they kill dozens of people and they do so alone, uh, that the victims are generally beaten, stabbed, strangled, or tortured to death, that they're all very intelligent, have high mobility, are driven to kill because they were sexually abused as children, cannot stop, and want to be caught. Um, this is obviously not true of all serial killers. One in five serial killers are black. Um, about 17% are women. Um, as far as insanity goes, insanity is a legal term and very few offenders are technically insane, about two to 4%. And while most serial killers are lust killers, some do not involve sexual assault, torture, or mutilation. While some do have very high body counts, most kill under 10. Um, about 25% have a partner. Um, most are of average intelligence, remain in a local area. Um, many also kill as a result of rejection and abandonment. And some serial killers have stopped for years. So BTK hadn't killed in a long time and then he decided to reach out to the media again. Uh, and that's how he was caught. So what are some developmental aspects of serial killers? Um, as I just said, many of them grow up in dysfunctional families and many grew up in poverty and unemployment. They've often been 
abandoned by their father before the age of 12, and if the father was present, he was generally domineering and physically violent. Um, so one thing we already know is that children raised in abusive households are more likely to respond to stress in life and violence. So certainly that would put um, these folks, uh, you know, certainly that would make sense in terms of serial killers. Many are isolated and lonely and they rely on fantasy. That fantasy feeds that anger and resentment and many never develop the ability to love. A lot of these sexual fantasies have themes of aggression, power, and control, and 81% report using pornography extensively. Now, these fantasies of power often lead to a fascination or even an obsession with police work, and many have either posed as police officers, um, worked as auxiliary police, or worked as security guards. Um, and here we just have kind of a list. So Ted Pundy um, was actually a law student, but he did work for the King County Crime Commission, he also worked at a suicide hotline. Uh, Wayne Williams, who is not actually convicted of any of the Atlanta child murders, um, took crime scene photos. John Wayne Gacy had a police radio in his home. Edmund Kemper, who you may be familiar with from the Netflix series Mindhunter, uh, actually went and talked to the police about the murders he committed. Um, and Dennis Rader um, worked for a security company installing alarms, UCTK. Uh, which is how he gained access to a lot of homes, but he also often impersonated um, police officers to gain access to victims. So this is basically an extension of their pathological need for dominance. Uh, it kind of makes sense to be attracted to law enforcement. Uh, impersonation of the police then is an extension of their fantasy life into the real world. Now usually a serial killer needs to be in complete control and fantasies often lead to feelings of temporary self-control. But then eventually that urge to kill is going to become uh, unbearable. And each murder results in further refinement of the fantasy. And every time the killer murders, the fantasy feeds off itself and becomes more structured. As the fantasy improves, so does the murder. And Ted Bundy referred to this as a quote-unquote learning curve. Now, serial killers often go through phases. The aura phase is where they're beginning to withdraw from reality and their senses are heightened. And this can last from several moments to several months, and it can begin with prolonged fantasy. The trolling phase is where they begin to stalk their potential victims. Uh, the wooing phase is where they attempt to gain the confidence of their victims. In the capture phase, they're rendered helpless. Um, So this is where they might lock doors, place a victim in a pit or box, um, blow, a, a, a blow to the head, or use chemical means. Now the murder phase is the actual ritualized killing, and the totem phase is where they take away some memento of the kill. Um, this could be removing or eating part of the body, removing or wearing skin, taking photos, and they use this to relive that experience. And finally, the depression phase is where that satisfaction begins to wane, and then we work our way back up through these phases again. Now, there are several serial killer typologies. One by Holds and DeBerger includes visionaries, missionaries, and hedonistic. Visionary kill because of visions that are believed to be the result of some type of psychosis, so like the son of Sam. Um, a missionary killer is someone who wants to do away with certain types of people, Whereas a hedonistic killer kills for the pleasure obtained from the process of killing. These include lust murderers, thrill-oriented killers, comfort-oriented killers, and power and control killers. So lust murderers are killing for sexual pleasure. This often involves brutal torture. Thrill-oriented killers are killing for excitement. Comfort-oriented killers are killing from the benefits received from that. That could be financial gain or psychological pleasure. And power and control killers gain great pleasure from power and control over victims. Um, and this may come from making the victim squirm. So they may torture or sexually mutilate victims as a way to dominate them. Now Hazelwood and Douglas are former FBI profilers and they talk about organized and disorganized killers. And it's more important to think of this as a continuum. An organized crime scene suggests the killer carefully planned and executed the murder. They're likely to exercise power over the victim by using restraint and raping or torturing the victim while still alive. While a disorganized killer appears to have been spontaneous and chaotic, they may be more likely to perform sexual acts on the victim after death and leave evidence of weapons at the scene. Now, as their career advances, they become more disorganized. 
The more disorganized they are, the easier they are to catch because they start making mistakes. Now, serial killers are often regarded as psychopaths. They use a mixture of charm, manipulation, intimidation, and violence to control others and satisfy their own needs. Now, people with antisocial personality disorder tend to be glib, superficially charming, and grandiose. They chronically lie and manipulate, no remorse or guilt. They have a shallow affect, a lack of empathy, and a failure to accept responsibility, and an impulsive, irresponsible, parasitic orientation to the world. So when we see this, it's kind of easy to see how those personality traits would often be found in serial killers. Now, again, your textbook has two really well done case studies, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Rader, and there was some information in there about Dahmer that I hadn't read before, so I highly recommend that you actually read these. Now, how many serial killers are there? Now, in the early 80s, some media outlets said, oh, there's as many as 5,000 serial killer victims each year in the US. This is an over-exaggeration. Now, in 1992, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime determined that between 1960 and 1991, we had 357 serial killers who killed 3,169 victims, about 102 victims per year. Now, how many are currently uh, killing is generally some, probably somewhere between 35 and 50. Now, the states with the highest, with the most actual serial killers are California, Florida, New York, Texas, Illinois, Georgia, and Ohio, whereas the states with the highest rate of serial murder are um, Alaska, Delaware, Idaho, Kansas, that's probably supposed to be North Dakota, um, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Utah, Vermont, and Wyoming. Yay, Massachusetts isn't on the list. And that wraps up this chapter.